Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode for the Blades of Vorterra podcast. I apologize for the uh, little stoppage that happened in the middle there. Uh, I'm getting a lot of blue screens, so if it does happen again, I apologize. But uh, I am Crimson. I'm the creative director for the project, and I'll be here to talk with uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Reckless. Uh, hello. Reckless is uh, one of our 3D artists for the game. Uh, what do you mostly do in the game development world of Blades of Orterra? Um, uh, as you said, I'm the 3D artist uh, for Blades of Orterra. Um, I do environmental art, uh, props, and uh, help work on characters if need be. Awesome. So that's what he's mostly doing. Um, we were going to have uh, Stratosphere on the stream as well, but he couldn't make it, so... Uh, it was a bit of a bummer, but uh, we, we're, we're still here, and uh, we have a few topics to talk about for uh, this month. Uh, we're mostly going to go over a lot of stuff that we've had in the past months as well for 2017, so it's going to be a fairly jam-packed uh, podcast. We're mostly going to be talking about the uh, Hall of the King. Uh, we're going to be talking about our own things, what we're mostly interested in for uh, the game and uh, what we want to see in 2018. Um, we're pretty excited for what's coming up, and we have a few things behind the scenes that even Reckless is also working on. So uh, there's some exciting stuff coming. Can't talk too much about the behind the scenes because that would spoil it, and uh, nobody likes spoilers, so we're going to avoid doing that. Um, so... A little bit of what uh, a little bit of what Reckless is working on is uh, the town of beginnings or the city of beginnings. Uh, I'm generally working on the Hall of the King, um, but let's talk a little bit about the town of beginnings because we haven't really discussed this uh, too much um, to you guys. It's been kind of hush hush. Um, but in in your own words, Reckless, what would you say? is the theme for the city of Begin beginnings is it like a a really crowded area is it like broken down in, in, in like how you see it how would you see it like if you were to picture yourself in the city hmm. um so the direction uh that i want to see it go towards is like something lived in where where it is crowded and busy but not in a sense where it's just too uh, too clunky. Like I, I uh, something lived in. Like I, I think that's the direction mm -hmm. where we really do want to go in. Uh, it's just showing that it, it is a large city that is going to be where you know uh, obviously the town of beginnings. So just the starting place. So you're you're expecting to see very lived in, organized kind of uh, a city, uh, but just uh, trying to emulate. Something that has, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little lost for words. Just, just lived in, like that. That's the main yeah, like a like of, a hometown. Yeah, so something like, and looking at a lot of stuff from, uh, you know, some of the real life designs that we have in Roman cities or old Greek cities, and uh, the developments and development cities in like Italy or something in Venice, and like mm -hmm. the really populated city planning that looks a little congested. But it's something that just makes sense once you're there and uh, walking around in the environment, how the environment's laid out, where houses are very close together. And it, like I said, you know, it's just very lived in and mm -hmm. just something believable where it actually looks like, uh, you know, different parts of it's elevated. You're going to have different uh, different parts of the city. There's different elevation levels where, you know, it's gr a gradual descending to the lower uh, of the city parts. And yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So uh, one of the important things with the uh, town of beginnings is, is that it's generally a social hub as well. Since the servers are um, are, ser are are player hosted, uh, a lot of the stuff that we have to do is kind of make a spot for everybody to kind of hang out in because we can't um, expand it over um, every single floor because then you know it doesn't become as crowded we kind of need like a little spot for players to kind of hang out in and meet up and uh, do all those sorts of things 
We also have plans for the uh, city beginnings since it is a nice like crowded, but also it's an organized kind of crowded system. Um, it's not like Toronto or California where people are dying because of car crashes, but um, it's more of people can walk through and there's there's NPCs walking by and, um, you know, it, it, it's colorful and there's kind of like a culture to it. Um, we really want to kind of get that going, uh, some kind of like feel of a culture, like people are following something. Uh, of course, there is going to be a church, but I don't think we're going to make this like a Game of Thrones where there's like a giant church and then it... actually that would be spoilers. I can't say that. Never mind. Anywho, uh, <laughs> um, but we, we want to kind of get a style for it. And um, the, one of the things that we do have to put in in terms of functionality is, is player shops, um, some player housing and all that kind of uh, fun stuff. And I think uh, Reckless is potentially going to be looking into the player housing later on throughout 2018. So I'm, I'm sure he's fairly excited for that um, since he's been working with uh, houses and buildings for quite a bit now. So um, yeah, it must be like a nice change of pace working on interiors. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it's, it's great to like start building the exteriors and trying to uh, do the environmental design and level design and mm -hmm. uh, sit doing the city planning. But it's also, you know, like you said, uh, a good change of pace where you can actually start doing the interiors. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I've been practicing a little bit with that, trying to get a feel for how, how the, the flow for the actual interior designing does, because, uh, you know, it'll be a separate kind of scene mm -hmm. uh, when a player enters a building. So... You get not only to do the exterior level design, but then you start getting to do the interior stuff, which uh, I, I've had a little experience doing it, some interior work on uh, other projects. And, uh, you know, it's just cool to bring, bring bring life for the interiors as well as the exteriors to, to make it, you know, really fit the theme of like when you, well, my thoughts are when I designed the building, you know, what purpose is it going to serve? Is it going to be a blacksmith or mm -hmm. is it going to be a bar scene or a tavern or an inn? So then you really want to portray what 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 the building is and to sell it further when you get in. So it's going to be its whole own really big thing to make everything fit and feel. And so the player walks in and knows where they're at. So Yeah, exactly. So like uh, if we have, let's say, a, a building that's a little fancier than usual, um, we kind of want to show if it is a shop, it has, you know, a signpost at the front of it or something with an icon on it. And uh, potentially, if it is part of the seed system, that it will mark it on the map and then that player can start trading with other people in terms of that information. Um, so, you know, things like clothing shops and all that kind of fun stuff, you know, you can kind of we want to make it so that sometimes you'll just randomly go into an alleyway and you'll find this fancy shop that you wouldn't find anywhere else. I think that'd be really cool. And like um, it's one of those things that that kind of adds on to the exploration and the, the randomization of all the shops kind of gives more of uh, rewarding for walking around in the alleyways. Because usually when you're when you're in a game, let's say Black Desert Online, uh, sometimes when you go in alleyways, you don't exactly get rewarded for going in those alleyways. It's just kind of nice to look at and you're just kind of walking through it. But, um, you know, it's always nice when you randomly find something that's different than, uh, in this example, shops, you find something that's different than other usual market shops that you find that has generic, you know, weapons and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's pretty exciting. You can do some fancy stuff. Let's say you have like a reggae shop or something. Uh, <laughs> uh, that would be kind of weird, actually. All right. So that's, that, that's the Town of Beginnings, um, which is in development at the moment. We're, we're not showing anything off of it yet because that is something that's behind the scenes. But... Um, we're working on that stuff. It's some exciting work. I think some we, we have released some screenshots of the actual buildings um, like in progress. So uh, we're always showing you guys what's in progress. That's I think one of the important things is being very transparent about what we're working on, but at the same time, not spoiling everything. Um, but that's what Reckless is working on. He's working on the, the town of beginnings. Uh, currently, we, we're doing uh, a little bit of like some interiors in terms of props but not like full-out interiors just yet since um, 
that's something that's in progress. We kind of have to look into the system of how we'd go into this building and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, we're mostly looking at like instance, but in terms of the combat module or the combat demo, which if uh, any of you are new to the podcast, the combat demo is going to be free. It's a, it's a small demo. That's a multiplayer, basically fight to the death, last person standing. Um, this is basically to get feedback and to test out our combat and to kind of bring something to you guys rather than just letting you guys wait, uh, wait it out the entire time. Um, on my side of things, I'm working on the Hall of the King, which is the one map for the combat module. Um, it's really exciting working on this because I'm, I'm learning a lot of things in terms of lighting and all that stuff. I think interior lighting is more complicated than exterior lighting. W would you agree, Reckless, that it's a little more complicated? Uh, for the interiors? Yeah, for some yeah, reason. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, I feel like uh, the exteriors are kind of fairly simple in a, in a sense that uh, you have one light source, which is going to be your main light, which is going to be your sun. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of lights, illuminates the entire world. And a little bit, you know, like say you have street posts mm -hmm. with uh, lanterns or something, you know, you just put a, you know, a little light there and you know how the radius of it is going to be weak depending on the light source. And if... You know, if we're relating back to these fantasy worlds, they have like, you know, gas powered or maybe, you know, just candle power. So, you know, the lights aren't too much. So when you get into an interior, you're thinking about the cost, caustics, uh, lights bouncing off of walls and how that light would illuminate the interior and how big it is. And mm -hmm. it, I think it's definitely a little bit more in trouble or a lot more detailed to get your interiors kind of um, lit specifically to make the overall feel and and you know your theme of what yeah. you're trying to do yeah sometimes it's, it's kind of it, it's kind of difficult to grasp because we're, we're still kind of looking into the art style we, we mostly have a, a grasp for what our style we want to go with we're going for kind of realistic with a, a few little um what would you call that like higher exposure or like a little darker than usual but of course, it's a little bit stylized. We don't want to go too crazy realistic because we do still want it to be um, fairly smooth. Because sometimes with realism, you have a lot of grungy stuff if you were to look outside on dirt and all that kind of fun stuff. But um, in some spots, obviously, we do want to have some gr like a lot of grunge to it, like caves. Caves are really rough. Caves are a little bit more uh, difficult to get the interior going. But of course, you can kind of add some gameplay mechanics to it. Like a player brings in a lantern to kind of light up the area and while he's walking through it and exploring, um, which which kind of gives uh, an incentive to actually finding those sorts of items uh, in in, for example, for black in Black Desert Online, you can kind of raise the brightness. Of course, you could probably do that in game and that would help out as well. But in Black Desert Online, there were some areas that you kind of needed that lantern. You know, that you know, that item that I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Back in the day in uh, the original KR, because I've been playing Black Desert since uh, Korean uh, Korean Beta 2. And back in the day, we used to have true dark, meaning like it was pitch black. And a lot of the game elements that Black Desert actually implemented in the early stages were really unique and cool because uh, there was an actual reason to have the lantern that you got from a quest because mm -hmm. it illuminated the night because i mean you literally could not see four feet in front of yourself but then after a couple patches they kind of patched out the dark 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 nights because they were just like oh you know it's bothersome but it's like you know some of the cool design elements it it, it gives purpose for those items like oh, when yeah, you definitely. completely take out the night which they completely revert, reverted the nights to be like you know pretty bright uh, there was no purpose for the lantern anymore. Like it was just like, well, useless. yeah, it's useless. Like you know, so having that ability, like in in the sense of, yeah, you could raise your gamma up, but having those true dark nights back in the uh, early development of Black Desert was awesome because the, the lantern literally had a true purpose now because it was so dark. Mm -hmm. Without a lantern, you couldn't see anything around you. So. You could think of like a night raid where you you're going to storm or uh, someone's castle or a keep or a town, and it's completely pitch dark. You know mm -hmm. uh, that would really make people utilize certain items of the game uh, a lot more than just turning your gamma up. So. Oh yeah, definitely. I think I think that's one of the uh, one of the things that we kind of want to touch upon is is 
uh, dark, but not too crazy dark to the point where it's unenjoyable. Like we want to make yeah. it so that if we were to add in torches and all those sorts of things, which we most likely will to light up areas, we want to make it so those things actually have purpose. Uh, because well, if there's no purpose and what's the point of adding it in, right? They're, like, I think yeah. having a nighttime, when you think about it, like you said, a night raid, you could probably utilize that to your advantage. Like if there were areas that were completely like dark, just nighttime, it's just one of those things that it'll it'll come to your advantage, but also your disadvantage. Because if you have a light, people will see you. But you could obviously just turn it off whenever you see somebody. <laughs> yeah. Just hide in a bush and just turn off your lantern. Um, but yeah, in terms of the Hall of the King, going a little off topic here, um, I, I personally, I think the quality does get there. It does have a fairly good quality um, that's there. In, term, in term, For me, I'm, I'm very picky when it comes to quality. So uh, whenever I look at the Hall of the King, I, I for the most part, like the materials and um, the lighting. The lighting, I feel like, could be improved in some spots, and make it a little bit brighter, have more feel to it. But I, I think it definitely is grasping that feel that we want. Um, I think you've seen a few screenshots of it, Reckless. W what would you say is happening there is it like a good quality or would you expect better for the project in terms of no, lighting? i um as of right now i, I think it's uh, at a great spot like uh you know we talked a little bit about the lighting when you were doing different lighting elements and uh testing some things to uh, emulate it better or a more realistic approach to your flames while saving resources mm -hmm. um and you know we, we came up with that one kind of solve is like you know you I think it emulates what you're going for. Like the torches really give the, the luminescence of like a fire, a shimmering fire. And, you know, uh, if we're thinking back in these days where they use torches and actual, you know, fire mm -hmm. and the openness of the windows to light the room, you know, you're going to have a little bit more of a darker uh, interior. And I, I think the fire emulates more of a realistic approach for the Hall of the King. Because, uh, you know, the way the, the lights bouncing off the walls and reflecting off the, the, the floors and the lights from the outside illuminate everything, you know, it just adds mm -hmm. that, that extra depth of, uh, you know, photorealism or yeah, uh, sure. realism in general. Like, I, I really think you did a great job and it's coming along great. Um, I, I think with the lighting uh, and the materials that you have currently and, and uh, reflect on, like, the actual real materials that would be used in that situation. So like, I know the floors are probably like a marble type material uh, just due to the reflections and, you know, that time period that you're trying to emulate and the overall quality as well as the lighting. I think you did a great job and the Hall of the Kings really emulates that time period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because usually a king, you know, when you think about a king, they have fancy stuff, you know, and there's gold everywhere. We, obviously in this area, there's no gold, so it kind of shows it might be a little bit of a poorer king, but he still has a marble floor, so he's still a king, right? So um, that's, I think that's one of the things, a nice reflective floor uh, works pretty well in this situation. So uh, that's one of the things for the Hall of the King. Uh, we're obviously going to try to optimize it as much as we can, so people with lower spec PCs can play it. Uh, I feel like the reflections might cause a bit of... Um, a bit of a problem with lower end GPUs, but uh, we'll see if we can kind of disable it a little bit or fake it a little bit more. So people with lower uh, lower spec PCs, they still have a bit of quality to it, but it, it's runnable. Um, so I think that's that's one of the things that we are going to be focusing on pretty soon is uh, optimization. Um, in terms of uh, the release date, I think a lot of people ask, uh, when is the release date going to be for the combat module? In fact, that's like the only question that's really asked for any game that's in development. Uh, it's probably the most asked question is, when is the release date? Even Sometimes even when there's a release date on the front page, people still ask the question, when is the release date? <laughs> I've noticed that for some of the games. Um, but uh, we're looking at the end of the year for the combat module, if none of you know. Um, we did say at some point throughout this year, we did say early 2017. Um, but we know for a fact we have our timeline, we have our schedule for the combat module and what we need to do. We're looking at the end of the year. Um, so Q4 2017 is probably the most accurate um, timeline that we're looking at right now. Uh, we don't have a specific date. We can't say like December or 
November 7th or something. We, we can't say that just yet. Uh, we'll let you guys know uh, throughout this uh, Q4 of uh, 2017. Um, so in terms of combat, this is one of the things that we want to talk about is um, how we'd play in the game in terms of combat. Um, personally, I know what I want to do, but I actually don't really know what Reckless wants to play as. So uh, let's say you're the game is finished uh, and you're playing the game. What kind of combat style would you be going with or like what kind of character would you kind of build towards throughout the game? Um, I really like uh, in, in every game I play mainly, I play like a rogue class. So very, very stealthy or, you know, very... Um, Glass cannon-ish, like oh, lots of damage cannon. output, uh, bursts, but he can't stay in a fight for too long. Like if it gets targeted, it's going to go down fast. So, mm -hmm. um, that's usually the classes I play in RPGs or MMOs. Uh, you know, just get in, get out, take down a target, and then get out very quickly. So yeah, so like high damage, low health, sort of thing. Correct. Yeah, I used to play characters like that, but I think it's one of those things that uh, <laughs> once you get more towards the end game, I've noticed with a lot of games depending on how you build your character and how good you are at escaping, you get one hit. So <laughs> typically that wouldn't be my thing. I'd be more of um, a two-handed weapon kind of person because I, I love that feeling. A lot of games try to emulate it. Um, and there is a few games that I've seen that really do this well. I think there's, um, what's it called? For Honor, I think does it pretty well where they emulate that, that feeling of weight in the weapon. So I think one of my favorite kind of types of weapons is probably a two-handed weapon so like a great sword or something and uh i don't i don't actually like heavy armor i i'm, I'm more of like kind of like a glass cannon with a heavy weapon i'm like a guy that's flailing around a tree but my, me myself i'm a bamboo stick right so um so I'd, I'd probably go with more like lighter armor like you're saying rogue uh rogue would probably be like cloth or something like that Some, something super light um, I'd probably do that as well, so I could just run at people with a giant sword. I think that'd be great. I think that's more of like a Dark Souls kind of play style anyway, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember watching a bunch of PvP for that. It was just mayhem. Um, so that's what I'm mostly looking forward to. I think we, we definitely are adding in a, a great sword um, combat style or a two-handed weapon combat style into the combat module. In fact, we have animations for it, so that's definitely going to be in. So uh, I'm excited to get that going. Right now we're working on one-handed weapon and I think one-handed and shield, we have that as well. So we're going to be adding that in. Uh, we wanted to get daggers, so you're saying for a rogue, you'd mostly go with daggers, right? Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, because daggers is usually the the go-to for a glass cannon because it's quick and then you can just run out so you don't have that big of a time span in the animation um so that's that, that's something that we were looking into but i don't think there's anything out there at the moment in terms of uh dagger animations and we need quite a few to get that that going it's possible though but um you know just have to make sure that we can get it throughout the year um we don't have any money for mocap so can't do that sadly get like a, an actor or something and get that going but someday we'll get that going i think that's that's definitely important um so one of the things that's important to mention is that throughout the game the game is going to be classless so when you create your character you just put in all the things the attributes that you want in terms of like oh how do you want him to look the hair and uh, all that kind of stuff we might have some additional things in the future but uh, we're looking at a classless design, which means that you are not going to be attached to a class. Let's say in Black Desert, there's the Elementalist, um, which does like a set of abilities. Um, in this game, since we're mostly focused on melee, uh, more of what we're doing is um, there's abilities or um, the skill tree, I guess you could call it. And whatever you're leveling up is more of what you're going to be going towards. So it's your choice what you want to go with. Let's say you're leveling up daggers, the dagger weapon type. That's what you're mostly going to be focusing on. Uh, of course, you can focus on, on other things as well. That's the, the, the beauty of a classless design is that you can go from a daggers and be like, okay, I don't exactly enjoy this. And you can start going to a two-handed weapon. Of course, uh, if you were to go really late game, 
and then you go to two-handed weapons, but you didn't use two-handed weapons at all, you'd be at like level one for two-handed weapons. So there's this kind of like leveling system for uh, weaponry that we want to go with. Um, and as you level things up, you could be like, okay, I can use uh, one dagger at uh, level five, uh, up to level like 15 or something for my dagger weapon type. But once I'm at level 16, I can start dual wielding daggers. So I think it's it's one of those things to uh, to kind of add on to the progression for characters and kind of build upon their their play style, but uh, also giving the freedom of you know switching at any time. Can you roll to dodge? Yes. We're, well, actually rolling. I don't know if we have a rolling animation, but we do have dodging that's going to be in, as well as blocking all that kind of stuff to kind of avoid an attack. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what we're doing for the classless design in terms of in terms of features in the game. So we got things like uh, that we're planning on is like blacksmith, uh, blacksmithing. Um, got things like cooking that we have uh, in plans. I I I want to be uh, I want to be Gordon Ramsay yelling at people to cook things. Uh, I think that's uh, an exciting feature that I'm looking forward to. Um, <laughs> uh, and out of all of let's say like we're we're looking at the perspective of Sao um, Reckless, what would you say? would be your favorite feature in, let's say, uh, what would be your fe favorite feature in that show if it were to be in the game? Um, but like um, a proper gameplay thing, not something like, oh, you die and you die in real life. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been yeah. mentioned a lot. Um, just uh, what, I, what I would like to see is like... Um, the more open free markets for for stuff like so like there's a game called albion online and one of their trailers for the actual game was like you know every job matters every person matters from like the person collecting raw materials who sells the raw materials to someone to that makes it into a finer material or refines that material into something else which sells it to you know like a blacksmith to make a weapon or something you know mm -hmm. so just that aspect if you know um in sword art online you had people that weren't combatants or PVPers or nothing. They just like, you know, like that blacksmith, uh, one of the, the blacksmiths that crafted his other sword, you know? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Specific items, which, you know, he had to go hunt down and get these special items for her to forge a sword and stuff. Like, uh, so so if we can have that aspect, like I think that aspect of that, that gaming, that game itself <clears throat> was really cool because it made everybody have a place and have an importance you know and like so if mm -hmm. someone could get really well known or raise their skill level so high in a certain thing that they're a sought out crafter for say armor or weapons like i think that would be a really cool neat feature that yeah. uh a lot of games have lost over time like uh yeah definitely it's, because it's, it's not like that anymore yeah because a lot of people are like okay i'm so far high level that and there's so many different players that at some point it's not even special anymore because all of those players have that ability to uh let's say blacksmith like the highest level armor there's probably like let's say we look at runescape there's probably like a thousand people that can already do it or more than that that's for sure like fifty thousand people yeah. so you wouldn't exactly look for a person to do that you just in that game you just more more so look at the grand exchange and just buy it from there you just go to the market um, there wouldn't be a process for that. I think that's why they added the Iron Man uh, mode, which is basically you can't trade with other players or use the Grand Exchange. So literally you do everything yourself. Um, but I feel like if we had that in here without the whole doing it yourself, you could still be with other players and kind of help each other out. So you have one person who does mining and has a really high level and can mine these specific gems and minerals. Um, and then his friend does blacksmithing and can actually use those minerals. Because the other friend might not even have uh, the specific level to use those minerals. So it becomes kind of useless. They can obviously sell it, but the other guy can smith it. So uh, I think that that's something that's really important as well as making sure that the features of the game are actually working together rather than just kind of slapped in. I think a lot of games do that where they just kind of slap in features and it's just you kind of wonder what's the point of having that feature in and... Um, I think I, I've seen that in a few games where there's just a useless kind of just skill to just waste time. I think, oh, RuneScape. In RuneScape, there was this skill called Divination, uh, which kind of had some use, but it, for the most part, it was kind of useless, uh, where you basically just catch orbs. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was it. Just that catch it? orbs. Yep. You click on something, and that's it. Yep. And then you you craft things, but you don't craft like fancy things. You craft like another thing. With let's say you add in ten fish to this orb, it uh, then you slap it on the floor, and then you get thirty fish. So <laughs> it's like so. Um, it wasn't exactly that entertaining. So I think one of the things that we want to look at is um, making features that work together and are not boring. Uh, I think that's one thing that we wanted to do with skills. I'm really looking into kind of like picturing how I want to do it, but with like cooking and stuff, I want people to kind of look for the resources. Let's say you want cinnamon, you actually look for cinnamon and you add it to like a bowl or something. I kind of want to add in that feeling of, of um, you're actually cooking the thing rather than the characters cooking it, right? Um, which I think a lot of games do where you just click on something and you just wait for it to be done. I think that's kind of boring in my opinion um, when you think about it because it's just a grind, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's one of the important things that I'm really, really wanted to look into. Um, we've got a question from Trips. Will there be player killing other than PvP? Yes. We have a design where as you go further into the floors, it becomes more and more dangerous in terms of player killing. So on the first floor, I think it's more of a tutorial floor. Um, so you can still do dueling, but it's more of like you're not going to be able to. I, I think what the design was is you can't play or kill on the first floor. But once you get to floor five, it's more of uh, all hell goes loose. And there's still bounties and stuff, but it's, um, it's like you, you can get killed at that floor. I think that kind of enables people to learn the game as they go through and... Uh, I think that's one of the important things is we're not we're not making it so people just get out of the safe zone in floor one and then poof they're dead because some guy sh like some guy slash them in the face. Um, so that's pretty important. All right, our next topic is what our favorite theme is in the game. Um, generally, what we're looking at is for each floor or we're calling them kingdoms. Uh, we want to add a lot of variety. We don't want to make it so you're on floor one, which is a nice little forests and stuff it's nice colorful uh not too broken down uh and then you see the exact same thing on like floor six uh because then it's boring it's not it's not unique um which then you go back to floor one which is a social hub and it's fairly important throughout the entire game and you're just like this isn't an important location and i think that's one of the things that we're, we're looking into is having a different biome and stuff for every uh every kingdom and making sure that it's actually unique throughout the game. Um, for me, if we were to add in a location, I think personally, I'm pretty excited if we were to have like a tropical kind of like islands and you'd be able to sail to each island and stuff. I think that'd be pretty sick. Uh, kind of like pirates, you know, but like pirates of the Caribbean, being able to like sail to places. And I think that would look really nice because you have the sun, you got beaches, you got tropical forests, you got all that kind of stuff. Um, what would you say would be your favorite kind of like theme for a location, Reckless? Hmm. That's a tough one. I, I really like uh, the, the the fantasy worlds. So I, I want to see like flying islands or, you know, floating islands and, you know, maybe dragons or just mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like that type of environment for me is is like my favorite fantasy type oh, yeah. locations or environments so you know like medieval type buildings or medieval type towns or um you know dragons magic uh you know, lush forests mm -hmm. with you know like old school uh fantasy creatures you know centaurs and like just... uh, lord of the rings kind of yeah lord of the rings stuff you know like literally the what was the dragon called that was um in the mountain and it was full with gold i forget what it was called uh, uh i completely forgot lord of the rings dragon in the mountain because there was a dragon that was in the mountain and nobody could uh nobody could go inside because this dragon was there and it was like addicted to the gold or something if i remember correctly it was in the hobbit so, if anybody watched The Hobbit, uh, please let me know what the name was because I forgot. <laughs> Smog was it? Was that what it was Smog? I think that's what it was. Yeah. Uh, invaded the Dwarf Kingdom. Yeah, that's what it was. So you know, there was this mountain that had like floors upon floors, and I think there was mines as well. But at the bottom of it, there was just a, a 
crap ton of gold. It was kind of insane. So I, I think that's kind of what you're more more so looking for is like dragons. And then uh, if you were to cross the, the sea to one certain location, it'd be kind of like a dock, uh, like a fantasy dock. You would never really see this in real life because it's like on the water. It's like a tiny little island. Um, but yeah, I think that that'd be really cool. Is, uh, dragons, I think, is a big part of fantasy. Uh, you know, you got Game of Thrones and stuff um, nowadays, which is like, that's the hype dragons i think they did a really good job on the graphics for dragons but i feel like it, in a game sense it would be a little more complicated <laughs> um yeah, for sure yeah because when you're when they're blowing dra um fire um they kind of blow it out from their stomach and then out so i think that'd be kind of those kind of little details i think would emulate something more menacing is, is seeing all that stuff actually come um come into play is like the actual mesh or the, the the model for the dragon is actually really flexible i guess um that's something that's really important for any any monster honestly uh wolves all those sorts of things to kind of scare you um but at the same time just be super menacing and all that kind of stuff um i'm a very big person when it comes to details so i think that's important so in terms of 2018 we're four months away from 2018 it's uh it's august we're almost in september we're actually halfway to september so uh basically three months and a half right no yes no four months and a half no four months let's just say four months anywho um we're four months away from 2018 which means like we have four months to get the combat module going but in 2018 we have a lot of pre-production that's already going going on um we're planning out what we want to add in to the 20 um 2018 timeline uh we're looking at possibly having a pre-alpha. So the people who actually have keys are going to have access to it um, alongside uh, once we get to a Kickstarter, which we're planning for 2018. Um, people will also have the chance of getting into the pre-alpha as well. Uh, I think that's a nice little milestone or like a goal to add in for people to kind of like pitch in more money for a pre-alpha. I think it, it's one of those things that people are excited to um, to get into the pre-alpha but we don't want to make it too low because there are games where a, a lot of games where people kind of judge the pre-alpha entirely and they, they judge their final decision of the game off of the pre-alpha which is one of those things that we really want to um i think if we were to release a pre-alpha we want to make sure that we're not making it look bad like of course it is going to be very in progress because it is a pre-alpha but um we want to at least have enough to uh, not make it seem super buggy. I think it's fairly important. Um, but in terms of systems and the world and all that kind of stuff, we're going to be, we're, we're looking at obviously having a, a few floors, but um, what would you say, since you're mostly working on environments, what would you say is the more exciting thing that you want to work on, Reckless? Of course, there's interiors and stuff, but what would you, if you were to work on a system or a certain city or a, a certain location what would be your biggest interest would it be like foliage that you're interested in working on or just generally buildings in general uh i, I think a combination of uh, the two like um like i said my favorite environment would be like kind of castle type stuff so like creating castles or modular pieces to build castles or cities like that and then also like a, a nice like lush forest scene where you know making foliage boulders rocks mm -hmm. and then just learning how to you know edit the terrain to make it look uh really believable and uh, alive and natural so mm -hmm. yeah i think castles are one of those things that um you have to make sure that it's not uh tiling too much but it's really exciting to go through castles because you have all these especially if it's a big castle if you think about it if you're in the interior of it there's a lot of like it's like a maze if you think about it because there, there's so many rooms it's like a mansion so i think it'd be pretty cool to to work on that um of course we're going to have different styles for castles so in your in your perspective you'd probably want like kind of like an abandoned castle with like foliage and ivy and all that kind of stuff right like kind of like growing. yeah definitely like uh overwatch has a cool kind of uh, stage where 
you know, it goes to one of Reinhardt's places where they fought in Germany. Mm-hmm. And they, like, the inner, the last point of the push is kind of, like, inside of a castle and stuff. So oh, yeah. kinda, you see it's kind of deserted because there's foliage growing on the castle and moss all over. And it looks kind of abandoned. Yeah. And, uh, that type of scene is really, really great because it's, mi- it's mixing, you know, human uh, technology and architecture with, like, kind of nature reclaiming everything. So Yeah. Let me just show a screenshot for those who are we're not big on uh, Overwatch. It, it's it's got a lot of stone to it, and it has this big carpet path, this big red carpet that leads to the throne, and the throne is basically just like broken. It's a uh, it's pretty crazy. It's a really awesome design. So I think that'd be pretty cool. Is interiors of castles, and of course the exterior as well. Um, but if you think about it. You could probably do something similar to what Overwatch did. Instead of a carpet, you have just a path of broken uh, tiles, and it's just like a bunch of dirt, and then it just growing, growing from there. I think that'd be really cool. Um, but yeah, I think that, that that's one of the things I'm really interested in is foliage. Um, I'm pretty interested in working with foliage. Um, hopefully, at some point, we'll be getting. Uh, there's a software called Speedtree, which is really great for. Uh, any kind of foliage, trees, uh, basically just forest environments, those sorts of things. But uh, that's our plans for 2018. And uh, that was our last topic for the podcast. Uh, I'm going to make sure that when I edit it, all the video clips are going to be together and I'll make sure that it kind of intertwines. So I I apologize for all the technical difficulties that we've had here. Reckless probably was talking at one point. And he probably didn't realize I disconnected, so he kept talking, which is fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, but hopefully next time there won't be too many technical difficulties. I'm, I might get one of the other guys to stream for me because my computer is unstable and has emotional problems. So there's that. Um, but I want to thank you for joining in. Um, you can check out the YouTube video on at uh, youtube.com slash Blades of Orterra. I'm going to make sure I edit it. Like I said before, I'm going to make sure I edit it and uh, make sure it's working together. We're going to do a little quick uh, Q&A session for those who want who have some questions. Um, There is one question here from Trips. He's asking, will there be rank slash competitive? Um, I don't think so. In terms of the combat module, we probably won't have that. There might be some sort of like dueling system that we can incorporate that like people can bet I guess gold on each other or something like that. I think that'd be kind of cool to have. Um, it gives this like incentive for dueling and opens up the server to more events. I think that'd be pretty cool. But uh, if anybody has any more questions, uh, just feel free to ask and we'll definitely answer them if we can, of course. Reckless, what would you think about like a ranking system in like, or we have like a system to start competitions at like floor one or something in an arena which i think we plan on having somewhat of an arena uh a separate arena system inside the game itself would work out uh one of the best games best mmos i've ever played in my life was called lineage 2 which was a korean based mmo which centered around it was literally singly player driven for everything it was a the true sense of a sandbox game um where everything was by the players so the markets So the crafters would sell their stuff by setting up a shop and they would sit down just like in RuneScape, you know, like Mm -hmm. they would sell their stuff exclusively from their shop directly to the players. So it was the economy was completely controlled by the players and how much they wanted to charge and think up they made their up their own prices, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, PVP happened because, you know, when you went to farm spots, you had a level in groups of nine uh, in a group of nine uh, because that was the player size for the party. Um, So. Uh, they had something called the Coliseum, which was a tournament for every month, and it was a month-long battle, and <clears throat> everybody participated. It was like a 1v1, and you know, you had you had two separate sections. You had a 1v1 of you know your class versus any other classes, right? And it was a point-based system. So everyone started off with say 30 points, and then every win you got. Uh, Q, uh, you got one third of the total amount of points your opponent has. 
So say you won, you would take one third of that person's points mm -hmm. and so on and so far. So the higher you, the more wins you get, the more points you accumulate. When you take a loss, it, it may hit harder, but it's also depending on how much points the, that person has. Like, so if they were more around uh, 50 to 100 points of you, they would take one third. If they were very, very low, they wouldn't take much from you. They would take maybe 10 points or something. It's Olympian, which uh, consisted of 1v1 battles throughout the month. So, uh, you know, everybody would compete in a 1v1 situation. There was 26 different classes, and uh, whoever had the most points accumulated on their class uh, at the end of the month was crowned hero. They would get like a, a godlike aura. They would also get specific skills that only hero classes that competed in the Olympian system would get. And they would also get uh, like a, a GM type uh, server chat voice. So when they when they talked, the entire server saw saw them talk talk or chat. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had uh, hero type weapons, which had their own hero glows as well. Uh, so, and that existed inside the game already, on top of all the PvP that already happened in the world, op like in the open world, sporadically and dynamically. So, this was a schedule type thing for players that very much wanted to pit their skills against other players in a very structured type situation. And then there was other things like sieges and territory wars and random PvP that happened throughout the day to even get a farm spot because mm. you had to defend your spot or your right to uh pve and everybody and it, and it wasn't about who had the most gear it's about who worked the best together teamwork wise so uh that was something very important with the game and uh the olympian system could be that tournament system where we could take a look at it and like you know adopt some inspiration from because not a lot of games after Lineage 2 had anything remotely similar to their combat system, to their to the way the mechanics of PvP actually happened, and the random dynamicness of PvP that happens randomly in the world. Like, it was really cool. Yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. Like, having a tournament that happens, like, once a month, and let's say that person gets, like, a special cloak or a cape and a crown or something, and it gives, like... Uh, really nice stats or something but then it like vanishes after 15 or after a month and then the next competition starts i think that'd be really cool to kind of give yeah, incentive so, to go into it yeah so like after um after you win hero you like i said you you would get like a few extra skills you could use that had like pretty long cooldowns so they weren't too op uh, their weapons had special stats, but it wasn't game breaking. They were uh, like maybe a, a little bit more resistance to CCs, or a little bit more HP, or a little bit more uh, a little bit more attack speed. It wasn't too broken, but it was just an incentive enough to be like, "Look, I'm special. I've got a glowy weapon. Mm -hmm. It has more stats. You know, just something you, you got to balance. You know, you don't want something game breaking, but it did. It was awesome to be first. You would walk around with a godlike aura." So people knew who you were. It, it wasn't yeah. even a title. It was just like your character glow, uh, was glowing like a GM or something, you know. So <laughs> that, and then on top of like global chat, like you can chat, and the entire server would see it. So yeah, like a giant, a giant light bulb. You know, people would probably party with you just to, so they can see inside of a cave. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. I think that would be a, a fairly interesting thing to look into is a, a sort of like a fixed tournament system that. Um, either w the players could fix it or like start the tournament or we can make it so it automatically starts uh, every yeah it hours. would automatically it would automatically start uh, at the same time every day and it would run for four hours a day and mm -hmm. then it would close down so everybody would know it was that time of the day to go to or to the tournament to do it and it, it started every day and it ended the same day and that way it kept it fair for everyone because, you know, people would be at work. So you couldn't just do it 24-7. Mm -hmm. It would be a set period so you know what time it starts. So you know your, what time you need to get there and make sure you're there. And it would run that whole month. And it would have, like, maybe a little bit, like, of um, a little bit downtime, like, two or three hours on the exchange of the next month. And everybody would lose their hero status. They would lose their special abilities. They would lose the glow. They would lose the the weapons because mm -hmm. once once uh once that say say someone beats you out for that month and uh you're not no longer a hero of your class your 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 uh, your hero glow would go away your skills would go away and your weapons would disappear. 
and then whoever got it that month would get the ability to claim mm -hmm. their weapon of their choice uh to and they automatically get special skills and the glow so yeah so it's like unique traits which i think is is, is pretty cool because it kind of kind of intertwines with what sao had they had some unique things right you know like only one person would have this clothing and whatnot um so it kind of comes into that, but it also is, it's fairly fair because it's a rotation. People can get that as long as they're working for it. And, uh, correct, correct. Yeah. So I think that that's definitely something that it could possibly come in because it's not, it's not like, oh, I got this thing. Nobody can ever get it unless I sell it. Um, it's more of, hey, I got this thing for a limited time. It'll help me out, but then it'll be to the next person who gets that hero status. Um, so that's pretty sick. Uh, there was a question here that was about the combat. Um, Trey Hacks is asking, uh, I missed you guys talking about it. Uh, how exactly will the combat work? I've seen you say things like Dark Souls. Will there be things like pairing and directional attacks, different stances? Um, in the past, we have had uh, directional attacks, but we've kind of strayed away from it because it's one of those things that requires around six animations per attack, which then you need combo attacks. So you... It, comes down to like 12 animations just for swinging in uh basic uh basic attacks we have uh looked into it but we're we've removed a directional attack for now there will be things like pairing uh in different stances the stance system is actually the thing that we've recently added in and we're working on right now is making it so that you actually have three stances with your weapon and this will be for every single weapon um, you have the light stance, you have the hybrid stance, and then you have the heavy stance or the strong stance. Uh, and the differences between them are all there. Like the hybrid stance is in the middle. So you're not focused on speed nor damage. You're just in the middle. Uh, the light stance is you're super focused on the speed of your attacks, uh, but you're not focused on like doing heavy damage attacks. So you're not, ha you're not focused on like penetrating the let's say a dragon's armor or something, you're more focused on kind of either distracting it or doing a super quick attack to kind of get a little bit of damage in, which I guess like Reckless would kind of be the quick attack kind of person or even hybrid. Um, so it gives that, that kind of like feeling of you have choices of how you do things, but on top of it as well, in PvP, you'll be able to switch along the, the stances and kind of play around with it. And somebody will be attacking you with light attacks, but then all of a sudden they come in with a heavy attack and you kind of just don't notice it. And it uh, breaks the whole uh, pattern away. Uh, parrying, we're kind of looking into it as kind of a, a quick block. Uh, I think we're, we're still looking into the uh, mechanics for that. We do have blocking, which basically just as, as you hold it, it drains more stamina. So you have to kind of use it um, in a smart way, but uh, we're looking at pairing as uh, I'm not exactly sure how we're, we're going about it at the moment. Uh, we've had a few different iterations of it, but uh, I'll be able to get back to you probably in the next uh, developer update. So that's something that's uh, yeah, that'll that'll definitely be in. I think that's one thing that we do want to touch upon is uh, how is the combat going to work and how is it going to feel. That's something that we really are looking into is looking at other games, seeing what they did right, what they did wrong, and what we can kind of fix upon for uh, for Blades of Orterra. But yeah, we've had some pretty cool discussions. We talked about the, um, uh, what was it called? Was it uh, Albion or was that the other game um, for the, uh, uh, the Colosseum kind of dueling? Oh, uh, Lineage 2. Oh, that's Lineage 2. Okay. That, that was a pretty cool discussion. I think that's something that we can definitely look into and uh, touch upon. You know, we also talked about the Hall of the King and future plans. For those who are still interested in the release date, just remember it's Q4 2017. We're, we're kind of, I think, in Q4. Or we're getting close to Q4 because I think it's 3, 6, 9, 12. Yeah, so we're almost in Q4. So generally in that time frame near the end of the year, um, you guys will start seeing some more stuff for the combat module and uh that's generally when we're probably going to have the release coming in so you guys can play that so um yeah thank you for joining in on this podcast i want to thank uh, reckless for taking the time to actually be here and uh struggle through my blue screens and technical <laughs> difficulties um it was nice to have you here obviously we didn't have stratosphere here which kind of sucks but it's all right hopefully in the next podcast we'll have 
a third person as well. I don't know if Reckless will be here. Who knows? Uh, that's all up to him. But... I'll definitely uh, try my best to make sure I'm here around. I'm pretty sure I can do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, having a few other people as well on the stream is also great. And uh, we're going to upload this on YouTube. We'll have the entire fixed section so you guys can watch it from start to end without any technical difficulties. I'll make sure that happens. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining in. We'll see you guys in the next podcast. Don't forget to look at our website, www.bladesforterra.com. Uh, lots of great information there, including including uh, blogs and uh, we're updating it as well. So soon there will be like a features page with all the features that we want to add into the game. So stay updated on that. There, there's also Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. So just uh, whatever you're using, just try to stay up to date. Anywho, thanks for joining in and uh, we'll see you later.